So, one more try. Okay, at least it's I'm getting cool. audio on my monitoring end here. So, um, I'm very sorry. It seems like the uh, OBS finally uh, started dying on us after having run for like one and a half weeks straight. So, there's a technical limitation of what OBS can do. I'm very sorry about that. Um, let's hope that now everything works fine again. Uh, our technical person in the background, Dirkish, who's mixing this talk, now has full control again and uh, will hopefully switch back to Urs. So, uh, and Urs, you can just start again. Again, very sorry. Okay. No worries. Okay. Hello, everybody. And um, now we had a little bit of. Uh, chance to see my uh, mute talking skills, but now the audio is working, so I shall start. And in this talk, I'll give you an overview of spacecraft life support systems, maybe a more in-depth overview than you ever cared about, but that is how I roll. Uh, so here we go. I'm Urs, I am sitting in Finland right now, as you can see behind me, I'm sitting in a wooden hut next to a lake where the lake is frozen over and I've been sitting here since March to uh, keep my distance from people because it's the farthest I could be from people without actually going to space. And the talk I'm giving is um, basically a part three in a series. The first one I gave in 2013 at the Gulasch Programmiernacht in German, um, how to fly spacecraft, which was basics of orbital navigation. Um, then there was the second part, how to build spacecraft in 2016, also in German which talked about materials and how to get it all to space and how to keep it together. And now this is part three, how to survive in spacecraft, concentrating on life support systems. In my normal everyday job, I'm a space physicist. I do big plasma physics simulations of the near Earth space, magnetic fields, solar wind, and so on. But that's not what I'm going to talk about here. All right, so where are we at? We are in a spacecraft. We are outside the atmosphere, which means there's no air no pressure, um, there are cosmic rays hitting us, there are temperature fluctuations, micrometroids running around, and all these kind of things. Um, for most of these, especially the cosmic rays and micrometroids, you can go back to the talk about how to build spacecraft, because you basically just need something shielding you around. Um, but this talk will especially focus on the fact that we're outside the atmosphere, and you'll need to somehow bring your own air that you can breathe. So what does a life support system actually do? I mean, sure, it keeps you alive, but what does a human need to be alive? On average, and this is from a NASA statistics page, one human on a space station consumes 830 grams of oxygen. That doesn't actually seem like much because, you know, it's not very heavy. Um, this corresponds to about 12 liters of oxygen only at normal pressure. Uh, but, of course, you are breathing in much more air. The air that you breathe only contains a small amount of oxygen, and you, when you're breathing it out, it only is a little bit reduced in oxygen. So about you only consume 830 grams of oxygen per day. You also eat food, um, and the average astronaut eats about 620 grams of food per day. This varies, of course, strongly from person to person. And you drink water, and these 3.5 kilograms are not just water that you drink, so few people drink three and a half uh, liters of water. This is also air moisture that you absorb through your lungs. This is the overall water balance that you put into your body. And your body does all kinds of funny things with it, and you produce as output about one kilogram of CO2. You notice already, you breathe in 800 grams of oxygen, and you get out one kilogram of CO2. So this carbon atom obviously got transferred from the food through your metabolism into the CO2. Then you lose uh, about 110 grams of what NASA calls metabolic solids. So that's the stuff you drop in the bowl. Um, and then you produce fluid as an output, and that's urine. And you can see also here there the mass has increased a little bit because some part of your food, I mean, salt, for example, goes into urine, and then um, some other products, metabolic products of your body. So the job of your life support system is to supply the stuff on the left and get rid of the stuff on the right in a way that does not make you uncomfortable. It also needs to keep the temperature in a comfortable range and keep smells away, especially the ones that are involved with the bottom two things on the right. Now, 
let's start with air. We want to have um, breathable air. And on Earth, we here have around us one bar of atmospheric pressure, and that is consisting of different things. And now I'm talking specifically about partial pressures here. So when we have this one bar of ambient pressure air around us, 78% of that is nitrogen. I'm talking here of 0 0.78 bar nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 1% others, especially that's helium, CO2, argon, these smaller constituents of the atmosphere. You can also just as easily leave out the nitrogen and run in an, in an atmosphere that's entirely only oxygen, but then you need to have a much lower pressure because otherwise you get oxygen toxicity. The other way around, you can also reduce the oxygen amount in the air, but then it gets quickly problematic. As soon as you go under about 0.15 bar of oxygen partial pressure, you get headaches, it gets loss of concentration. Um, and then if it goes even further down, starting at around 0.12 bar, uh, you get unconsciousness and death. So you don't want that. These factors, these, these um, boundaries here are quite specific from person to person, and especially people that live high in the mountains, in the Andes or in the Himalayas, they have a much higher um, tolerance for low oxygen amount because they produce more red blood cells and, um, and so on. Then this is something I heard in a talk a while back. The first symptom of hypoxia is unconsciousness. And that is a problem. If, if the oxygen amount goes down slowly, you'll get headaches and you'll suddenly notice that you only see black and white. But if your oxygen content rises quickly or slow, falls down quickly, you will not notice you are missing oxygen until you pass out. And then it's too late to act. So it's really important that the system keeps this on a good level. This already said, breathing without nitrogen is no problem. You can just reduce pressure and only have 0.21 bar oxygen, which is, for example, what you do in spacesuits. If you do that in a spacesuit, they're much less balloony and much easier to move in, so you have lower pressure. Um, but the disadvantage of this is that you then have a pure oxygen atmosphere and you will have lots and lots of increased fire risk. Stuff that you would normally not expect to ignite, ignites suddenly in a pure oxygen atmosphere. For example, aluminium or plastic or any kind of thing that can burn will burn in this. Uh, the Americans learned this quite uh, uncomfortably in Apollo 1, which had a disastrous fire accident on the launch pad before it even could take off, where three astronauts died. So because of this, you try to avoid pure oxygen atmospheres as much as possible and try to work in, well, imitating what you have on Earth at sea level. Now. How do you do this technically? How do you supply air that you can breathe? The obvious and easiest way to do this is to just take air and compress it in a bottle and breathe directly from the bottle via a pressure regulator. So you get air, you breathe that, and then you breathe it out. And since you're in a spacecraft, you can just breathe it out of space and gas it off. And that works quite OK. This is like a diving apparatus. Um, the disadvantage is in this bottle, you'll have 78% nitrogen. So that does actually nothing to your breathing. You're just wasting mass here. And in space flight, you always want to have stuff as light as possible, not to waste mass. So it would be much nicer to somehow recycle the air that you breathe out because you're breathing in 21% oxygen and you're still breathing out about 14%. So why not reuse that oxygen that you've just breathed out? So this system is impractical for more than a few hours of space flight. And actually, no um, spacefaring nation has ever used a system like this. Already the first Mercury flights of the Earth, the Vostok system in, um, of, of the Russians, also the Chinese capsules, all of them are already using more advanced systems. As far as I know, um, some of the commercial space, uh, space planes are now employing simply this method. If they're just doing a parabolic flight for a couple of minutes, it's fine. Um, but you should go beyond that right away. Better oxygen sources you can use are, for example, 100% compressed oxygen in bottles. You just use an oxygen bottle and breathe from that. Fair enough. Watch out, though, if you're not careful with this, then you have an explosion risk. This is a picture of a life support backpack from an American extravehicular mobility unit um, in the beginning of the shuttle program, where this was just being developed and tested. And you can see the 
oxygen bottle on the side was feeding oxygen into the pressure regulator here at the bottom, and that was made out of aluminium, and it caught fire, and the entire thing exploded. Three people got hurt. Nobody uh, fortunately died. Um, but that means that even NASA, who are building these professionally, have to uh, sometimes find out that they are not careful enough. The same design is, by the way, still in use. They just replaced this one regulator, and ever since then, the same um, life support pack has been used in the shuttles and the International Space Station ever since. Now there's an even better oxygen source, and um, that is called a oxygen candle. In this, um, depending on who designs these, either if it's a Russian design, you have sodium chlorate or for the US systems, you have lithium chloride packed with iron powder. And if you ignite that, so if you heat it up at one uh, ignition point high enough, they start to burn. This uh, sodium chloride just decays uh, to uh, basically there's a redox reaction to normal table salt, rust powder, and then there's two oxygen atoms left. And so that goes out of the system and supplies oxygen. So this is a compact, um, solid device that you can switch on by igniting it on one end, and then it slowly burns through over multiple hours. So this design, for example, burns for eight hours and supplies um, oxygen for three people for eight hours, which is very nice because then you don't need to care about pressure regulation. So you just ignite it on one end and it supplies you with oxygen. This is actually typically used in space stations as the backup system. Here's a picture from the old Mir space station where one of these oxygen candles was just being taken into use next to the regular life support system. This very much up here is also the point where the fire broke out on the space station Mir at the end, mid of the 90s, which then eventually caused the space station to be decommissioned because this thing gets very hot. Here on the left, you see um, the labeling on one of the American oxygen candles, hot surface when activated. They get up to 500 degrees or so, so you need to be careful with that. But it's a very nice way to produce oxygen without needing any further equipment. These are typically used as the backup system for the more complicated ones that we're getting to next. Now, before we go to the more complicated ones, however, we have to talk about the second half. If you remember the initial slide, you have oxygen coming in, and then the humans breathe CO2 out. So what do we do with the CO2? Uh, just bringing oxygen doesn't make a full life support system yet. If you have too much CO2, if you, for example, don't care about removing it, collects in your spacecraft, and the partial pressure of CO2 will rise and rise, and you will get lots of problems. Starting from 10 millibars of partial pressure, and that's much lower than the O2 pressures we had before, you start to get tired, you have concentration problems, you get tingly fingers and so on. And then starting from about 70 millibars, again, you have loss of consciousness and death. So you want to do something about that before it gets so far. And what can you do against CO2? Um, the straightforward method is chemically binding it. It's a, the so-called CO2 scrubber approach. You um, take CO2 and put it into water, and it forms carbonic acid. You all know this from fizzy drinks. That's just CO2 dissolved in water carbonic acid. If this is an acid, you can neutralize it. So you just um, let your CO2 flow through a container that contains some sort of basic material. For example, lithium hydroxide. You can also use potassium hydroxide, but lithium um, is a very favorite element in space flight because it's so light. So your CO2 reacts with the lithium hydroxide and it produces water and it produces lithium carbonate. And then the CO2 is gone from your system. These canisters look, for example, like this. This is one from the Apollo command module, where you have one side where the air gets pushed in by a fan, it flows to the, to the surface in there where there's lithium hydroxide, and then it comes out purged of CO2. These canisters um, in, in these typical shapes are working to remove the air that one person exhales for a couple hours. So this one, for example, had to be replaced every 12 hours. In the Apollo flights that lasted three days, they had just had enough of them along with them. But again, this is not yet a renewable system. And in the Apollo flights, there was an additional problem. In um, the flight of Apollo 13, there was an explosion on the way to the moon. Uh, there's 
this was actually an oxygen tank that exploded, but not one of oxygen for the life support system, but one that was supposed to fuel the fuel cells uh, for the electrical system. So the electrical system was gone and they couldn't use the command module anymore. And the astronauts would all have died if not they had the lunar lander attached to their spacecraft. So they evacuated to the lunar lander and were just living in there while they were flying around the moon and back to Earth. The problem with that is that the lunar lander was designed to support two people for two days, and now it had three people for three days. So its lithium hydroxide canisters simply were full before, uh, before planned, and there was no backup. They brought the canisters from the main command module and found that actually, since this is a US government spacecraft, the command module and the lunar lander were built by separate contractors and these contractors were not talking to each other. So they used very different design of their canisters and these did not fit together. So the thing on the right was what they would have needed to put into the lunar lander life support system, but those were full, so they only had the ones on the left. And um, then they had to get creative, and which uh, for me is the best proof that you can fix everything with gaffer tape if you only have enough of it. So they built an adapter out of some uh, spacesuit hoses and a small uh, ventilator, a book cover, lots of gaffer tape around the uh, lithium hy uh, hydroxide canister, and then they plugged it into the life support system. Here in the back, you still see this is where the original um, canisters were supposed to go in, and then these were patched in there. It also contains a, a dirty sock in the middle. They had to stuff this middle hole somehow, somehow and they just put a dirty sock in. So yes, with enough gaffer tape, you can fix everything, even in space. Um, then we get to spacesuit life support systems. They are basically the same idea, except built in a compact way. This is the backpack from an Apollo moonwalking suit. And you see here all the components we had before. There's an oxygen bottle that supplies breathing air, there's a CO2 scrubber that's sitting here horizontally, and then there's power supply and some pumps. And at the top here is a evaporation device to cool the spacesuit when you're in direct sunlight on the moon. That's basically all there is to it. The more modern designs um, look kind of similar. This is a Russian Orlan spacesuit that is nowadays being used on the ISS. You flip open the back of it and you climb in from behind, and then you open the door or your cosmonaut colleague opens your uh, uh, closes the door behind you and seals it here. And here you can see as well, there's an oxygen bottle, there's a, a scrubber container and so on, and that supplies oxygen for eight hours. Since it's only only about 800 grams, you can carry it all around in your spacesuit. And since you are in weightlessness anyway, weight doesn't matter. Now, if you want something like this, if you're now thinking, whoa, I want my own spacesuit, I don't want to breathe the air of the people around me, which is very understandable in 2020, you can actually buy these. For example, scuba rebreathing systems are commercially available. They set you back about 7,000 euros, but um, you can just go to a diving store and buy one of these. And these work very much by the same principle. You have a oxygen bottle attached to the back, and you have a container with soda lime. And soda lime is nothing else but uh, potassium hydroxide mixed with some other stuff, some, some dyes to see when the CO2 has saturated it and so on. But that's exactly what it is for. And um, I know some people from uh, the diving club of Alta University, shout outs to them for, from here, that own these devices and they have actually been going to the supermarket with a rebreathing loop um, to shop for groceries during the corona crisis. So if you don't for whatever reason, want to, to breathe the same air as the people around you, uh, get a scuba rebreathing device. It might also be useful if later you get to own a spaceship or something like that. Right. Um, now, now that we know how it works in, in the basic form and in a spacesuit, let's look at some actual life support systems that are being used nowadays. The SpaceX Dragon 2, which is currently attached to the International Space Station, has a um, pretty much run-of-the-mill life support system that we can now understand. Here's a diagram from a, from a SpaceX publication about that. Uh, you can see the capsule pressure vessel and basically at the bottom, so under the floor covers, is where all the magic happens. There you have a bunch of things that we can now identify. Here on both sides of it are these bottle packs. They have uh, two times three bottles. Of these actually only one, the top bottle, each is filled with um, 
pure oxygen, and the bottom two are filled with a mixture of um, nitrogen and oxygen. Um, the idea with that is if the capsule were to be evacuated, either because somebody needs to climb out or if there's a leak, they can repressurize it with basic um, compressed air from these two bottom bottles. And then to refresh the air as astronauts are breathing, they only need one of these top bottles each. Uh, also during re-entry, in order to cool the system, they just do adiabatic cooling. They open the valves and blow air through it, which cools the capsule. So they don't have any need for a more complicated cooling mechanism. In addition to that, they have um, these sort of lithium hydroxide canisters. They're actually a commercial model that apparently you can buy for submarine operations. And uh, these are a bit larger than the ones we've seen before from the Apollo thing. So these actually can be uh, left in place for one day of a four person crew in the spacecraft. And you can uh, take them out and exchange them. They have this replacement rack to the side here. If you're in the spacecraft and you look down and you open the covers, it looks something like this. You see the bottles here on the side, and then you see the active um, lithium hydroxide canister for CO2 scrubbing is in there, and then the three replacement ones. Once a day, one of the crew members needs to open it and swap the um, canister, but then it's fine. You also have the uh, urine container and the waste container here, so maybe you don't want to put your hand in there in space. One funny, um, feature of this life support system is also that toilet, which is part of this, um, sits on the ceiling. So while you're launching, you're actually sitting under the toilet of the spacecraft. Of course, during launch, it's probably unused yet. I'm not uh, sure how trustworthy this seems to the astronauts on re-entry when they're then suddenly sitting under the toilet. Um, but apparently this works well. I've heard no complaints about it. All right. So, um, Another real life life support system is the Soyuz cockpit. And uh, you may have seen something like this in the movie Gravity or something like that. It's full of displays and buttons and levers and so on. But the user interface of the life support system is actually completely supplied by these three valves. We have the two middle ones, which can be used to uh, regulate the oxygen flow from the main and backup systems. And then for the last stage of re-entry and also for emergency cases, the valve on the left opens the emergency oxygen flow. And that's all there is. The uh, fans are always running, the CO2 scrubbers are always scrubbing, and you do not need more than this as a user interface for your life support system. So you don't need to worry that much when you're in a Soyuz craft. If after a night of drinking with some Russians, you suddenly find yourself waking up in a Soyuz craft, you don't need to mess with many controls. If you have too little oxygen, you just turn these up. That's it. So now we've been talking about all these practical things that have been used in spacecraft, but these are not really reusable. I mean, we have oxygen bottles, and when they're empty, they're empty. We can't get new oxygen in space. And we have CO2 scrubbers, and when they're saturated with CO2, then they're full. Then you need to go back to Earth. So both the Soyuz spacecraft and the Dragon 2 have very reasonable life support systems so for what they're built for. They fly to the ISS, and then they come back in 90 minutes if you want to. They don't need anything more fancy. But for the space station itself, or anything more complex than that, you want something reusable. And how do you do that? There is a very practical endless source of oxygen available if you have electrical power, because you can simply take water, H2O, and with electrolytics, split it into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, in, on Earth, that's quite easy. You just put two electrodes into water, apply electric current, and you see the bubbles rising. One side gives you hydrogen, the other one side gives you oxygen. It's not that easy in uh, space, because the uh, if, if you put an electrode into water in zero gravity, it forms the bubble around the electrode, and then the electrode no longer touches the water because the bubble doesn't go anywhere. Um, but you can do it, and I can show you in a second how you do it. The first thing, though, you need to have a good source of water that you are not planning to use for anything else, like drinking. So what's a good source of water that you do not want to drink anymore? On the ISS, they simply use the toilet. Astronaut gets recycled into the oxygen system on the ISS. The oxygen system looks like this. So sometimes people ask if you are on the International Space Station and you are staying there for six months, do you have to drink your own pee in space or something like that? And the answer can be a resounding no, you don't need to drink your own pee. 
you will breathe your own pee. So, um, how does this work then? You see, these two racks are the life support water recycling system of the ISS. Uh, we have here a centrifuge where the water gets boiled and separated from salt and any, any other more complicated components of it. And then we have two more centrifuges that are the um, electrolysis system that actually takes the hydrogen and the oxygen apart. Uh, there are also other things like uh, filter system to get any other pollutants out, and then you need to regulate the pH level and so on. But in the end, P goes in one side of this device, oxygen comes out the other. And since you have solar panels and much more effective solar power in space than on Earth, uh, you can produce basically endless uh, amounts of oxygen by just splitting your P. Which leaves you with the problem of CO2. How do you do a reusable CO2 scrubbing? And uh, here nature gives us some wonderful materials. For example, activated charcoal. If you have a surface of activated charcoal and you let air containing CO2 run over it, CO2 molecules like to attach to the surface, but only one molecular layer. Uh, there are others that are working even better than charcoal. For example, there are some zeolites and some amines that you can use for that. I'm not going into too much detail of that here. So you let it run over and it attaches and the CO2 molecules stick to the surface. And after about one hour, the charcoal filter is full. No more CO2 attaches to it. What you can then do is you close the valve to your spacecraft and open the valve on the other side and open this surface to the vacuum of space. And you heat it up a little and it evaporates off to space. And then you've got a clean piece of charcoal again. That's exactly what this device does on the International Space Station. This is the so-called carbon dioxide removal assembly, and it has these fancy violet connectors. I like the design of this very much. Um, it has some zeolite absorption beds where the cabin air gets run into, and then after an hour or so when it's full, it gets closed off and open to the vacuum of space. And because then it's half the time open, half the time closed, there are actually two systems that are alternating between open and closed state. Here at the bottom, you see these two openings where it then attaches out to the outer side of the spacecraft and evaporates off to the vacuum of space. This um, method is called pressure swing ad adsorption because you are swinging between inner pressure and vacuum pressure outside. Now, if you have your CO2 removed, you can just vent it out, and that's mostly what is being done in the International Space Station. But there is another helpful chemical reaction that makes even more sense to do after that. We have CO2 and we just separated it using our pressure swing mechanism, um, and we also still have the hydrogen left from splitting our water. I mean, we split the water and we're breathing the oxygen, what do we do with the hydrogen? If these two are put together, they can chemically react to methane and water. Isn't that nice? Because we have something that we don't want and something that is no use for us, and we get something, at least a part of it, out that is good again, water as an input. In order to do this, unfortunately, it requires pretty high temperatures. So you need to heat these up to 300 degrees, and you need to do it under high pressure so that the molecules actually react with another. You also need a catalyst. Nickel is quite normal for this. Ruthenium is more efficient, but much more expensive. So that's what's used in space, because money doesn't matter. Um, and then you uh, need to first compress it, do that, and then expand it again for use in the space station. But the advantage of this is, from the original water that you put into your splitting, you have four water molecules that went in, you still recover two of them back. So you are getting half of your water recovered in every of these cycles. This is what the device looks like on the International Space Station, and it has lots and lots of tubes and complicated mechanisms because it contains the compression stage, it uh, needs to mix the input gases, needs to separate the output gases, and then expand it again and so on. It's installed right next to the carbon dioxide removal assembly. The second output here, methane, um, at the moment is just dumped overboard from the International Space Station. But in principle, this one can also still be used for something useful. It can be used as a rocket fuel. SpaceX's new rockets run with this. Or it can be heated um, and periodically uh, decay 
to uh, decompose to carbon and hydrogen again. Then you have the hydrogen used, uh, reusable. Um, the problem with this is that you need to basically put this in a steel tube and heat it to a thousand degrees, and then you have the carbon starting to layer on your steel tube. So this is not something you want in the space station right now, and this is not something that's over, overly practical. But um, it's a possibility for the future. Maybe on a Mars colony you can do this to get carbon for also for um, for fertilization of soils. So let's plug it all together. The ISS life support system looks like this. This is the American life support system in its original design when the ISS was launched in 1998. You still see here is a fancy tube screen that was used for computer controlling it and so on. This is also still the design that was supposed to include a shower here at the end. The shower never actually made it to the space station due to weight restrictions. Um, but there's the toilet, then there's the water processing assembly, the O2 generation, the carbon dioxide removal and all that. So it's not small, but it's also not too big, given that it's mostly um, regenerative. As a diagram, it looks like this. It has all the parts we now talked about. It generates oxygen by splitting water. It removes CO2 from the air and then Part of the CO2 is still vented overboard and part is fed into the Sabatier system. Also part of the hydrogen is vented overboard and part is fed into the system and then the methane currently gets vented overboard. Noteworthy here is um, there are only two inputs in the system. One is nitrogen, which is just used to regulate the atmospheric pressure. That's actually a very small amount. Basically, you only need to counteract some leaks in your station, not much. And the other one is only water. So the only thing you need in the ISS to keep people alive is water and electricity. How much water? Um, I found some conflicting reports. I looked to ISS status reports of the last couple of years. Uh, one thing I found from 2010 was talking about the entire station uses seven and a half liters of water per day, which is not that much. Um, but then with newly updated systems, a mu more recent report was talking about only a little bit over one liter of water per day. And that would be quite amazing because that's a tiny amount to supply all the crew members. Um, yet there's still a venting overboard, and especially it's it's kind of um, unsatisfying that this carbon atom, I mean, it came into the human body as food, then we breathed it out to CO2, and then we vent it overboard. Wouldn't it be nice if there were somebody who would like to make use of the carbon atom? Wouldn't it be great if something could use the carbon atom from CO2? And indeed, there is. I mean, we humans turn oxygen to CO2 through respiration. And the other way around, plants and other green life forms, for example, cyanobacteria and some um, other microorganisms, turn CO2 back into oxygen through photosynthesis. And experiments have shown that many plants do just fine in space without gravity. Here's a picture of salad growing on the ISS. They're growing these on, not actually in soil, but in some growth pillows. They contain nutrients, and then you put the seed in and a little bit of water, and they grow out. In general, plants that want to grow upwards and want to form stalks or grow away from gravity have a bit of problems in zero gravity because they don't know where to grow, and then they get weird shapes and sometimes don't properly work. But if you have something like this, which is just a salad, it just wants to be a leaf, it grows just fine. Um, so the question is, why not just stuff your spacecraft full of plants and um, see if that works as a, as a life support system? This is not just a good idea to support you, like to get your CO2 away and supply you with oxygen. It's also such that um, plants have psychologically uh, been shown to be a big comfort factor. I mean, uh, if you are living in a gray box of a spacecraft all the time, it's actually very nice to be able to tend to a little flower now and then, maybe even talk to it if you're starting to go crazy or before you're starting to grow crazy. Um, this picture here shows the first flower that has ever bloomed outside the Earth. That's a zinnia that was in the VIG-01 experiment on the ISS. Here you see the same plant pillows being used. Um, so this brings the question, how much green stuff does one human actually require for its life support. And basically all spacefaring nations have done some experiments about that. Uh, the Russians were the first ones. They set this up, uh, the BIOS facilities, um, BIOS 3 especially, since 1972. 
this is an underground steel enclosed um, well la laboratory in the wonderful city of Krasnoyarsk in Siberia, um, where uh, people have been living since 1972 in continuous experiments. Uh, they have successfully had people in complete isolation, so the system was completely shut off, only electricity, electric power going in, for 180 days. And they were eating the food that they were growing, and the plants were supplying their oxygen, and it worked fine. Their research showed that you need about 8 square meters of plant growth area to supply sufficient oxygen for one person, which is not as big as you might think. Of course, they chose plants to be ideal yield, especially there are small growing varieties of wheat, super weed and dwarf weed that grow very quickly and produce lots of biomass. So eight square meters they found is sufficient to supply oxygen for one person. Um, they also found that it's not sufficient to supply uh, food for one person and their calculation came to that you need about 11 square meters to supply food for one person, uh, yet they uh, supplemented protein and some additional meat products and so on. Uh, from from their stores, so they did not just only eat the um, the stuff they grew there. The Chinese Space Agency, and China is very keen on going to the moon, they also have a very similar experiment running since 2014. Um, the Moon Palace 1 in Beijing looks like this. It has two growing chambers and one living chamber, and three people have successfully lived in there in isolation for the longest I found was 105 days. And the difference to the Russian system is, A, it's a more modern form of, of uh, enclosed uh, farming. They are using vertical farms stacked in multiple layers with LED lighting, so it's more energy efficient. And then they are also recycling the human waste as fertilizer, and they are growing their own uh, animal protein by having mealworms. Um, and there was a very funny part of the, the article that they had invited Western astronauts to participate in the study, but they refused due to the idea of eating mealworms as their primary diet. Um, but apparently mealworms, they get about finger-sized and they are 75% protein and quite practical for enclosed ecosystems like this. Um, then the Americans, always keen to overdo things, also had an um, experiment for enclosed ecosystems called the Biosphere 2. Uh, in the end of the 80s, a billionaire decided that he wants to do the biggest and best uh, ever biosphere project like this and he invested enormous amounts of money building this in the desert without consulting scientists too much, though. And it turned out not so well. Um, the first experiment was unsuccessful because, as it turned out, if you put a greenhouse full of plants, you have trees here, you see wood. Wood is not green. Wood is brown. Wood does not photosynthesize. So lots of the biomass they put in was actually not doing anything. They also had a part simulating desert, and as it turns out, the cactus is not a good source for photosynthesis if you want to live off it. Um, then they also wanted to make it look like nature, so they built uh, all these stone structures out of concrete. And they used the same kind of concrete that, for example, Disneyland uses to build artificial mountains and so on. The problem is when concrete is freshly set and curing, it is absorbing CO2 from the air because of the reactions that are going on in the concrete curing. So what happened there is that the concrete absorbed all the CO2 from the air, which was fine at first, but then the oxygen, like the plants, stopped doing photosynthesis because there was no CO2 for them to work with. And then the oxygen levels dropped and they had to resupply multiple times uh, oxygen from the outside because it did not really work. There are nowadays other and less overdone um, uh, closed ecosystem research facilities, one in Utah, one at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, and they are in, on smaller scales producing very successfully um, enclosed bio uh, um, life support system results. But this one was a quite famous and quite unsuccessful one. In spacecraft, um, so far, there has not been the attempt to supply large amounts, the, the major amount of life support to plants. There are, though, some experiments on the ISS, apart from the plants that we've seen earlier that are mostly grown to, to test plant growing per se. There's now a so-called photobioreactor running in the ISS. Um, this is the wreck of the European life support system uh, that works in a similar system as the one described before, and on its CO2 output line, enriched CO2 enriched air gets fed into these boxes here on the side. And in these boxes, there are 
algae, uh, microscopic algae called chlorella vulgaris, um, in a watery solution, and they are being supplied this CO2 rich air and light, and they um, turn it into oxygen, and they also produce edible biomass. This very same alga is used, for example, in Japanese cuisine as a seasoning. So you can um, use it, or you can drink it as a protein shake, maybe. Inside these boxes, uh, this reactor looks like this. You have a bit of a problem if you want to bubble CO2 through a uh, algae solution in zero gravity, because bubbles don't rise. So this system is pumping um, the air and water mixture around through this lightning source over time, and that way the, um, the photobioreactor produces oxygen. So that works well. Here's another picture of another astronaut just uh, taking out the bottle where the alga solution is stored. So you can, after a while, when the alga have grown big enough, you take this out, you pour some of it out, or maybe drink it, maybe bring it home to Earth for analysis and fill in new water and some nutrients and put it back in to continue operation. But as you, as you saw, this is just a small device. This is maybe 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. This is not enough to supply even a single human. We've, we've seen you need maybe eight square meters of that. It's a, it's a test, but um, since it seems to be running well, this is something that can probably be scaled up to run entire spacecraft life support systems. A second one that's been on the uh, ISS, that's also very interesting. Uh, this is an even smaller one. So this is really, you can see the comparison to the fingers, has been using cyanobacteria. And if you go to the supermarket and buy spirulina tablets, those are like dietary edition green, green tablets that contain um, protein. This is exactly the same cyanobacteria that they use in there. And this also manages to produce um, oxygen quite successfully. And I, I'm linking this specifically because there's a website about a guy who just did this at home. Um, he uh, took some, some clear bottles, put uh, these cyanobacteria and water in there and produced his own oxygen that way. So if you have a hackerspace and want to run it like a spaceship, uh, you can think of just doing that. You take some maybe clear glass or plastic tubes, fill them with water, put the cyanobacteria in, and you produce your own oxygen and get rid of your CO2. So again, another hint for the year 2020, if you don't want to breathe other people's air, this is a very practical way to do it. And this can be basically done with household material. Um, then one thing to think of if you have uh, an enclosed ecosystem, even if you have perfect CO2 removal and oxygen replenishment, you are still in a closed box and you're still breathing the same air over and over again. So whatever other gases you produce, and I'm not specifically talking about gases coming from your butt, but I'm also talking about those, um, even small concentrations will accumulate over time. So if you are not taking care of them, your spacecraft will get smelly and it might also get in other ways problematic. One example was a plant growth experiment on the Russian space station Mir. They were trying to grow wheat just to see how well it goes in zero gravity. It was a continuation actually of this uh, Russian bios experiment trying to run it in the mirror, and everything grew well. Um, they even got large amounts of results. This is from their research paper. They found that um, everything grew even better than on Earth, and when they returned the seeds to Earth, they found that all of them were sterile, uh, and they didn't quite understand why. I mean, there was no obvious DNA damage from radiation or anything, and there was also no obvious reason why zero gravity would make um, wheat seeds sterile. And then they did a bunch of experiments, and after many years, they published this paper and found that actually ethylene gas um, was trapped in the space station, and they didn't do anything to remove it. And ethylene gas is a plant hormone. You probably know it from uh, the supermarket bananas. If you have uh, a supermarket, you can always buy fresh yellow bananas, but they're being harvested on the other side of the planet, so how does that work? You ship them while they're green, and then you give them ethylene gas, and that's a hormone for the bananas to turn yellow and ripe. And it has lots of different effects on different plants, and as it happens, in the concentration that they had here, it made the weed grow um, sterile. So this didn't work. So you have to take into account what are your trace, trace gas concentrations as you grow plants in space. And this, this actually also leads to the interesting question, if, if plant hormones, gaseous plant hormones, have so strong effects on wheat, how is it with humans? I mean, so far, 
we've always had uh, astronauts under very controlled conditions in space stations for a long time. Uh, but what if in control in in commercial spaceflight coming up, you will suddenly have let's say teenagers flying in a spacecraft together? Do their hormones suddenly accumulate? Does it cause psychological problems? This is nothing that's been researched yet, but I find the idea very interesting that maybe there are uh, biological messengers that we actually are unaware of that are very much concentrated and then causing causing issues in the future. Um, another thing that is a problem in space stations is smells. Um, not just smells produced by humans, but also mold. Here's a picture from the International Space Station. Um, it's on the, the in the Russian, I think, the Svesda module, where the astronauts typically hang their towels to, to dry after workout. And as you can see, there's a, a nasty looking black patch of mold growing there. I'm not quite sure which mold this one is, but there have been samples from different parts of the ISS brought to Earth and analyzed, and they found that Aspergillus niger, for example, that's the common black food mold, grows very nicely on the ISS. And there were ideas, maybe this needs to be sterilized, maybe we just go around with a big UV light lamp, because UV light tends to kill uh, fungal spores. But as it, as it turns out, Aspergillus niger produces uh, melanin, which is just the same brown uh, colorant that's also in skin and in hair and so on. And it produces so much of it that it's basically resistant to UV radiation. So you can't kill it like that. You also can't kill it by shutting all the, all the doors and evacuating the air because as it turns out, it has spores that survive vacuum. So it looks like you will not get rid of mold in spacecraft anytime soon. At the moment, they're just scrubbing the surfaces with alcohol now and then, and that way trying to keep it in check. But um, on the space station Mir, there was in the end of its lifetime, the problem that actually mold was growing through insulation foam layers on the walls of the space station. And the smell got so bad that astronaut, uh, cosmonauts um, apparently developed a so-called second space sickness. The first one, the normal space sickness you get when you fly to space and you get weightlessness and some people throw up. And then there was the second one, whenever astronauts returned into the space station from, for example, a uh, spacewalk where they had their clean spacesuit and then they went to the space station and they, it smelled so bad that they got physically sick from it. Likewise, um, there are stories of Soyuz spacecraft landing in Kazakhstan and the people that opened these space capsules for the first time, they had problems that um, the astronauts brought with them the ugly smell of space. So spacecraft tend to be quite smelly, it seems. How do you get rid of that? Well, uh, one way, of course, is plants help with this. If you have lots of plants, they make your air smell nice and they, they filter the air, especially the sort of plants that have um, air roots. They are just make the room atmosphere better. This is, in this case, literally the, the way they do it. But you can, of course, also use uh, chemical methods for it. If you heat your air to 500 degrees, it destroys most organic molecules. They just simply do pyrolysis and fall apart or burn even. With suitable catalysts, you can also um, make this more efficient. You can also make it destroy ammonia because ammonia is a, a compound that forms in your, in your sweat and if ammonia accumulates too much, it starts to attack plastic and parts of the life support system. So you want to get rid of ammonia um, and sulfur and so on. So lead your air, heat your air up, run it over a catalyst and just keep cycling it through it. And that keeps the um, trace contaminants on the ISS under control. Activated charcoal filters also work well to get more, more complex molecules out of the air. All of these are running on the ISS. The problem with this is that they are still quite bulky. If you have a small spacecraft, if you just want in a small capsule to return to Earth, you normally don't have these, and these tend to get smelly. So um, if you are thinking in terms of science fiction and, and nice and fancy stuff everywhere, be aware most of the uh, spacecraft you see in science fiction are probably very smelly. Right, and that brings us to the conclusion. Um, life support systems have developed a lot and they are uh, practical in surviving in space and they are not too bulky, but also not too small. Uh, it's almost time for completely closed systems. We're still venting a bit of the International Space Station into space all the time, but with enough plants in the loop, it's probably going to be soon such that you are in a completely enclosed system where you only need to put electricity in. Um, Bioregenerative systems are not just important in space, you can also have them in your home and 
live nicely with them. So if you run your hackerspace like a spaceship, maybe start building one yourself. It's not that complicated. If you want to know more, I've published a book about all this and even more. Uh, there's also a German version if you Google for it. It's uh, available in the typical places where you find books. So I am very much looking forward to your questions and uh, hope you learned something for your life in space. Yeah. Um, blown. Um, <laughs> pretty amazing talk. Um, one thing maybe that we want to fix right away. Um, we're still having some audio issues and I'm very sorry about that to the stream. Um, we luckily did... Uh, uh, backup recording locally uh, at Urs's place uh, like like we said earlier he's like in the depths of Finland somewhere in a little hut and internet connection is not that great but it's amazing that it's working as it is Urs um, if you could uh, in in the in the share that we have this webcam shared there's a small eye icon on the button if you click on mm -hmm. that um, we'll turn off your video and we are hoping that even though we cannot see you anymore, that maybe the audio now has a better bandwidth and at least, yeah, we can yep. hear you better. So, yeah, Let, let's try it like let's this. Let's see if this works. Okay. So um, our lovely signal angel has collected a bunch of questions and the chat was super on fire. Like, <laughs> I actually had the IRC channel open all the time and I saw messages scrolling through. So shout out to the IRC channel. Yeah, I think this was like uh, the worst shift ever for Signal Angel. Uh, so much to do. But there are a few questions. So let's go through them. Um, first question was, wait, can you breathe just 100% oxygen at 0.2 bar? Yes, that works. This is how it's usually done in spacesuits. Uh, in order to reduce their bulkiness, you just reduce the pressure. The problem is not breathing 100% oxygen at 0.2 bar. The problem is getting there. Because if you start from a normal environment, like sea level environment, and you just depressurize yourself, your blood will boil. Because you have lots of gases dissolved in your tissue, in your blood, and so on. You need to really slowly go down with your pressure. Otherwise, your, your nitrogen is going to form bubbles in your, in your tissue and tear your body uh, apart. So what they typically do on the International Space Station is um, they go to the airlock a couple of hours before a space walk and start to lower the pressure gradually. In the past, what they used to do was um, camp out. So overnight, they were already the night before sleeping in the airlock, and then the next morning they went out. Uh, nowadays, they found a more efficient method is they put on the spacesuit with normal pressure, um, start filling it with oxygen slowly and reducing the pressure, and then sit on the cycle ergometer and just cycle, 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 because that pumps the air or the uh, nitrogen out of your system. So uh, it's a similar problem if you are diving and you are in 50 meters depth and you suddenly come to the surface, you would die because uh, the compressed nitrogen expands and that causes problems. But apart from that, yes, you can easily survive in 100% oxygen atmosphere as long as the pressure is low enough that it doesn't get toxic. Yeah, it's like uh, when diving, you know, normal atmosphere is sort of space and diving is your spaceship and you need to slowly depressurize. Um, next question regarding oxygen candles. Uh, if this thing burns to release oxygen, doesn't it need oxygen for the burning process again? I think this is maybe a slight misnomer. He, he, uh, not really. I mean, I can probably go back to the slide, wherever it was. Um, dum, 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 dum. They don't need oxygen for burning because it's a redox reaction. I mean, you have um, the potassium chloride or sodium chloride coming in um, and iron powder that it reacts with, and it simply passes one oxygen from this one to the iron. So the oxygen ends up here. Uh, redox reaction just give, uh, reduces and oxidizes at the same point. So it brings its own oxygen along and it actually has oxygen to spare. That's why these produce oxygen as they burn. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, uh, something for the chemistry nerds there. Uh, so these slides will, of course, be up in the recording and you can go through the equations probably and yes. find it out yourself. Um, is there any advantage to using either sodium chloride or lithium chloride? 
Um, the advantage of sodium chloride is that it is dirt cheap. It's really just table salt that you can get from anywhere. And then you just need to uh, have the reactions to get the oxygen on there. In comparison, lithium chloride is uh, more of a problem. A, it's more expensive. And B, lithium salts in general have psychological effects if they get out. If you have any dust coming out, lithium salts are, have been used for a long time to try to cure depression. So you don't want too much of that flying around in your space station. The advantage of lithium, on the other hand, is that it's much lighter and weight is always at a premium in space. So um, it's, a, it's a trade-off and the Russians have decided to go with sodium, whereas the Americans have decided to go with lithium. So that's both our options. Cool. Um, and there's a question, I think, to this this equation where, you know, inputs of some masses and output of some masses. And the uh, question was, so the additional carbon is essentially coming from the food sources. Could this be recycled in plant materials? Yes. I mean, that's basically what the, the second half of my talk was about. I mean, I, I saw the question scrolling by uh, as I was still talking about the the methods in the beginning that's exactly the point you have the carbon uh, coming from the food going through your system being turned into co2 and then the plants do the opposite and turn it back into their sugars that they build the materials out of so that's where the idea comes from to use plants as life support systems yeah pretty much like a circle of life inside a spaceship essentially yeah i was i was thinking in the beginning should i draw this such that these arrows actually go around but then i thought it's a bit disgusting to just draw an arrow from the urine back to the water <laughs> 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 well, uh, it seems to me like there's lots of pretty disgusting smells and everything, so people might not have been shocked that that much I more. Was, I was actually talking to a Swedish astronaut um, a couple of weeks back. He was uh, giving a, a seminar in Helsinki, and I asked him this. Did he have the feeling, he, he was actually working on the outside of the International Space Station installing um, one of the solar panels. Did he have the feeling that it got smelly in his spacesuit? And he said that he was so busy doing everything that he didn't notice, but some of his colleagues remarked about the smell all the time in the space station. And apparently, um, when you look at web streams of astronauts returning to the space station when they've been there before and then come back, it's always the first thing they say when they enter the space station. They remark on the smell, ah, the ISS smell. It's apparently a very characteristic smell on the space station. Wow, yeah. Sadly, most of us will not be able to experience it, but mm -hmm. uh, apparently it's legendary. So let's leave it at that. Um, Okay, next question. Uh, when scaling up from space stations to bigger habitats like Mars colonies or even O'Neill cylinders, does something fundamental change about what to consider and how to build life support systems? Uh, well, it, there's already some questions that need to be addressed when scaling up from what we have now. Like we have, for example, the, the Dragon capsule that just wants to fly for three days, go to the ISS, go back to Earth, that's it. So there you don't need to consider much. You just build the scrubber and you have oxygen bottles and you're good. Of course, this still needs to be reliable and work very well, but um, that's that's where we are right now. The International Space Station um, is almost completely um, reusable in terms of its life support system. Um, but the problem with that is it still designs as an experiment platform. The system fails from time to time, and then they had problems that they need to change to the Russian system instead of the American because something breaks here, something breaks there. One thing that you really definitely want if you fly to Mars or if you have a colony is you want the system to be fail safe. You need to build it such that it's serviceable. You need to build it such that it is um, redundant enough and that it, well, ideally that it cannot break down. And that is one additional advantage of plants because plants don't break down. If one dies, the next one grows in its place. As long as you don't poison the whole life support system altogether, uh, you'll be able to just scale it up by just giving it more place to grow. So these algae systems, if you want to have more algae growing, all you need to do is put an additional bottle there Put some lights up and you can grow more of it. Um, so that is something that act is in active development because people want to fly to Mars pretty soon. I mean, Elon Musk keeps talking about it in the next five years, um, but nobody has proven yet that there is a life support system that is reliable enough to actually get you there. You don't want to strand halfway with a non-working life support system. Um, 
And then as soon as you are on a planet and as soon as you can plant stuff in the ground, then there's no reason not to just go uh, full bananas with growing plants, uh, literally full bananas, I suppose. Um, there have been experiments with uh, uh, strawberries growing in uh, lunar soil. As long as you give them uh, water and a little bit of nitrogen, they're happy. They grow in lunar soil just fine. Um, then you have Martian dust equivalent studies of people trying to grow stuff on Martian soil. And that apparently is also something that is possible. So then you just need to go there and start growing things. And as soon as you have an ecosystem like, like the closed ecosystems that we've seen on Earth, where you have eight square meters per person, you can just scale up by getting eight more square meters for a second person. As soon as you have a life support system where you have eight square meters of plants growing for one person, you can just scale it up by adding another eight square meters and you have capacity for a second person. Mm -hmm. Pretty great. Yeah, that brings us to the, to the next uh, question. Um, yeah. I think maybe you've answered this already. Um, I'll just read it out. Uh, why is the entire system set up in one place? Seems to be super dangerous, single point of failure. Why not have multiple smaller systems? So loss of one could be compensated by sealing off a part of the station. And yeah, I think that's essentially what you just said, right? Yeah, well, on the ISS, there is um, the big system that I've shown. That's the American system in the Node 3 that does most of the work for the station. But the Russian part of the station also has a system that works in pretty much the same way. It's not quite as redundant. Um, so if anything were to happen, you could seal off the American part and run with the Russian system. Since uh, the last five years, there's also the European um, advanced closed loop system that has the bioreactor attached, and that's in the Columbus module. So that's again on the other end of the station. So right now there are three redundant life support systems running on the space station. Um, of course, the advantage of having it all in one place and together is that you can more easily feed stuff from one system to the other. If you want, for example, your water to come from your toilet into your water recycling system, and from there you want the hydrogen and the oxygen to go further into your other systems. So it's um, always a design question. How much redundancy and fail safety do you want and how much compactness of the system do you want? Uh, I suppose it's similar like any other. Yeah, the, the audio is again breaking up a lot. Um, I, I, I think I will... Um pick one last question here and then we'll wrap it up. Um, also time is starting to run out. So uh, last question uh, that I'll pick. Um, so someone would like to know if due to the growth of surface in square and the volume in cube, it gets easier or harder to create and maintain a life support system on spacecraft. Um, well, uh... Interesting question. Um, so in, in general, as, as there are more people, you just need more life support system, a bigger system, or you just build more smaller ones. So that should not be fundamentally a scaling problem. You just need more of them. Um, I would assume that bigger systems in general have higher efficiency because you can just devote more space to smaller things to, to more little cleaning assemblies and so on. But then on the other hand, you need more redundancy as well. So that's um, actually a very good question. Then there's also one thing now that I still have the slide up here, the, the numbers I have here, oxygen, food and water requirement, these are given by NASA for the standard crew member. So that is for one human male. NASA always calculates these in terms of human males. On average, female crew members um, have lower metabolic rates, so they use less calories, they also use less oxygen and less water proportionally. So actually, it makes no sense that NASA sends a majority of male uh, astronauts into space or the other space agencies as well, because uh, women simply uh, consume less resources from the life support system perspective. So um, if you want to make an argument why you should uh, accrue of women to Mars, this is your argument here. They reduce less life support resources. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a pretty big advantage right there. Like you can't argue with, with that, you know. Um, cool. So uh, I think 
we will wrap it up here. I see that you're also active in the IRC chat. So if you have any more questions, um, feel free to hit up the IRC chat. Maybe you can stick around a little bit and answer some more questions there. Yes, and I'll also be walking around the rcc.world in the cases where it works. Yeah, great. So if you catch us, if you catch us somewhere there, hit them up. Um, about the audio issues, I'm very sorry again. Uh, we do have some backup recording probably. We'll take a look right. at that and see if we can fix the audio. So uh, hopefully in the final release that we will make to media CCCDE, uh, the audio will be a little bit better again, sorry. Um, but yeah, was uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored that we were able to show like the third part of this trilogy about epic space adventure and what you need to do to make that happen uh, on our stage. Uh, thank you a lot. And I hope we'll have a great RC free for the rest of the day.